Greetings, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. Welcome to the second volume of Introducing Buddhism. As you know, the first volume consisted of a number of prominent Buddhists asking relevant questions regarding Buddhism. And for this second volume, we have invited a number of prominent Buddhists from various organizations acti active in the Buddhist Mahavihara Kuala Lumpur to ask a few questions of a distinguished panel of Buddhist monks whom I will be introducing to you in a few minutes time. But first of all, I'd like to inform you that the members of the studio audience are made up of the Sasana Abhivurdi Vardhana Society, the Sasana Abhivurdi Vardhana Society Youth Section, the Buddhist Missionary Society, the Buddhist Missionary Society Youth Section, the Buddhist Missionary Society Ladies Section, the BGS, the Buddhist Gem Fellowship. Without wasting any more time, please allow me to introduce to you the members of the panel. And first we have our most venerable Nayaka Mahatera, Venerable K. Sri Dhammananda Nayaka Mahatera, who, as you all know, is a very prominent figure in Buddhism, not only in Malaysia, but in all parts of the world as well. And we are highly privileged to have an old friend with us in the person of Venerable H. Gunaratna. Venerable Gunaratna was a member was serving in our temple a number of years ago and now he is at the Washington Buddhist Vihara and he has made a name for himself in not only as a meditation master but also in every other aspect of Buddhism in the Western world. We are also very privileged to have with us Venerable Vimala who is a monk from the United States and Venerable Bimala Jodi Tera, who is from Sri Lanka. And now, we are going to ask a number of questions, and in this first part, which will last about one hour, we will ask very general questions. Questions that you wanted to ask all your life, but never had the opportunity. We're asking that on your behalf. Now, can I invite mem some members from the audience to ask the first question of our distinguished panel. Do I see? Yes, Benny Lea. Uh, Venerable sir, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for allowing me to ask the first question. Uh, I'd like to know, we have always associated Buddhism with temples. Is it absolutely necessary that as Buddhists, for us to practice Buddhism, we need to, to go to temples? Thank you very much for inviting us to participate in this, in this discussion and answer to your question is very simple. Buddhism is not in the temple. Buddhism is in the mind. But the mind needs environment to maintain peace, devotion, confidence, understanding. So temple is needed to create that environment for that mind to maintain devotion and faith and also temple is a place where people can relax without fear, without worries, without tension, without suspicion, with full confidence. They can relax, so they get enough time to think, really, and gain some knowledge and understanding. On the other hand, there are monks and some others who can guide and advise and give necessary uh, information about religion or how to practice religion. Therefore, temple is 
is a very congenial place for people to practice Buddhism. For example, when we are sick, we can take treatment at home, but there is no guarantee, because the atmosphere at home is not very suitable. If you go to hospital, uh, there are doctors, well-trained nurses and medicines, all the medical facilities are available. Then we had to obey all their instructions and guidance and easily we can get cure our sicknesses. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Venerable Sirs. My name is P.K. Chi. I'm from Buddhist Missionary Society. Uh, I believe that uh, uh, other religions tend to tend to uh, associate or criticize Buddhists for being idol worshippers. So my question is, are we are we Buddhists really idol worshippers? <coughs> Actually, Buddhists are not idol worshippers, but ideal worshippers. Because, first thing, the word worshipping also wrong from the Buddhist point of view. We do not worship, but we pay homage, pay respect, in appreciation of the Buddha's highest achievement, perfection, supreme wisdom, enlightenment, therefore we pay homage. For that we use the word worshipping. But we do not worship idols. We worship the Buddha. But the image is important for us to concentrate because it is very difficult for us to maintain our mind because the senses can bring all sorts of external objects and disturb the mind. To avoid those external disturbances, we take the Buddha image as a symbol. And then very easily we can concentrate and we can recall the Buddha into our mind we can create the real Buddha in our mind, but the image is important for us to concentrate. On the other hand, some people take the Buddha image to recall the Buddha and reflect all the good qualities and virtues and wisdom of the Buddha. Then it turns into some sort of meditation. We call Buddha Nusrati Bhavana by reflecting all the great virtues and the qualities of the Buddha, they train their mind, then the image is important in that aspect. Therefore, it is wrong for people to say that we are idol worshippers because we do not expect anything in return from the idols, but we take the image as an object for us to train our mind to develop our concentration. Thank you. Most Venerable Reverend, I thought it would be relevant and uh, definitely useful for us to recognize the fact that the Buddha himself did not want an idol of himself in his lifetime, neither did he want idol worshipping as a practice. So I think there is always this misconception that this was something that is being promoted for perpetuating his goodness and his greatness. I think the fact, if you could uh, elaborate on this, in terms of the historical happenings, actual incidents where the Buddha had very categorically stated and how the devotees respected the bow tree first and then went on to bringing about the idol of the Buddha through cultural contact with the Western world. Thank you. I think you are right. There were several occasions when the disciples wanted to erect the image of the Buddha. The Buddha said, it is not necessary. 
he did not encourage for anybody to erect the Buddha image. There is no evidence to prove that there was any Buddha image in India for nearly 500 years after his passing away. First, they started to worship or pay respect to the lotus flower in, in place of the Buddha. Later, they have erected the feet of the Buddha, then paid respect. During Greek occupation, they have influenced Indians to erect the images and various other religious symbols, then started to erect the image. Another thing, the Buddha did not encourage for people to depend on his physical body or the image. So one of the disciples who had been experiencing emotional satisfaction by watching the Buddha image, I mean the Buddha's figure or the body, the Buddha said, by watching this dirty body you won't gain anything. If you really want to see the Buddha, you can see the real Buddha through the dharma or the doctrine that I have preached. That is why earlier also I mentioned, when we think about the great qualities and virtues of the Buddha, we can create the real Buddha figure in our mind without depending on images and idols. Good evening, Venerable Sirs. Uh, there are several religions in this country and uh, each one says we are the greatest. Why is it uh, it's so difficult one, for one religion to understand and appreciate another religion. Thank you. Religions, belief, faith, concept, ideas are in the mind. People maintain their own imagination through their hallucination or misunderstanding, if not, by creating some sort of ideas in their own mind because of their fear or worries or disturbances, then they have introduced different concepts, different practices different beliefs in the name of religion. So, when these two religious groups get together, they feel that there are a lot of differences in their belief, in their concept, in their ideas, in their understanding. Uh, that is why it is difficult for them to, what do you call, uh, it is not respect. Actually, today people respect each other and uh, appreciate also certain aspect of religion. And some others try to ridicule and criticize and accuse the followers of certain religion. But some understanding people, without criticizing, accusing, blaming, they try to show the similarities as well as uh, differences. Definitely there are differences. If there are no differences, it is difficult for people to maintain their own religious uh, belief and faith. On the other hand, religious practices depend on their way of life, their culture their tradition. So, in different countries, they have their own tradition, customs and way of life and their own way of thinking. So, religion also they uh, mold according to their way of thinking. Uh, that is why there are differences. But as Buddhists, it is our duty to not to show any hostility or discrimination or not 
to criticize or accuse or blame, but to understand, definitely there are differences. Thank you. Venerable Gunaratna, uh, maybe you could add on to this, having lived in the United States for such a long time and having also been living here, do you see any differences, any developments pertaining to this question of religious tolerance and understanding? I think what uh, Venerable uh, Nayakathera mentioned is quite uh, true. People don't like to respect other religions out of fear. They, many uh, people want to have a large number of adherents for psychological reasons. If they respect other religions, they think that they are going to lose their own followers. And therefore some people don't like to respect or appreciate the beliefs and practices of other religions. However, in countries like, uh, the, like Malaysia, the United States, there are various religions existing side by side. Among them, Buddhists are the ones who always like to live and let live. Buddhists everywhere like to agree to disagree. If people have different beliefs, different ideas, different practices, we have to, as Buddhists, respect them for their own uh, ideas and practices. In the United States, one country I know has one of the best constitutions in the world. The forefathers, the founders of the United States have written one wonderful constitution. According to U.S. Constitution, the United States is not a country of particular religion. It respects, appreciates all religious practices. We all enjoy the same, same privileges in the United States that any other religious persons have. For instance, religious organizations are tax exempt and we enjoy that privilege in the United States. Even the government does not interfere in religious affairs. That is one of the most important uh, aspects of uh, founders of the uh, U.S. Uh, Constitution. Sometimes, when one particular sect becomes stronger than the others, they try to dominate others. But if there is a respect for each other, then uh, nobody would be uh, threatened by others' domination. And therefore, as you all know, uh, Buddhism is known for its tolerance, understanding, patience, and living together with other, other religions, even among Buddhists, although there are different sects. They have never fought among themselves to promote, to spread their own particular sect. And also we know Buddhism is a religion of peace. It has never had any fight never shed a drop of blood in the name of Buddhism. This means that we like to live by the principle, by the precept of the Buddha, that is to uphold, maintain, support, peace, tolerance, understanding, not only among Buddhists but all others in the world. Thank you very much, Venerable Sir. And I'd like to add that Malaysia too, like in the United States, we do enjoy a great deal of such freedom and we should be really grateful for that as well. This is a very good evening. I would like to ask this question. Um, is, there, is there anywhere you find uh, extraordinary teaching in Buddhism that you cannot find in any other religions? Thank you.
Yes, that is a very good question. <laughs> there must be a reason for Buddha to introduce another religion, we have to use the word religion, in spite of various other religions that existed in India at that time. Main reason is Buddhism paved the way for people to think freely without depending on any external sources. But all the other existing religions depend on external sources. Second reason, Buddhism encouraged people to lead a normal life, not necessary to suffer in the name of religion, and not necessary to torture their physical body because of their religion. On the other hand, given due respect to human intelligence, because religions give faith, develop faith by giving something for people to believe. Buddhism never does that. Buddhism never give anything for people to believe. Buddhism encourage for people to open their mind to see, think unbiasedly, and then instead of developing faith or belief, they gain confidence and understanding. Uh, these are the extraordinary characteristics that we can find in the teachings of the Buddha just because the Buddha has introduced this religious way of life for us to maintain our human dignity, giving due respect to human intelligence and maintaining human qualities. Uh, that, these are the things that I have to mention as a special characteristic. Would you like to add to that? I like to add a footnote to Venerable's uh, remarks. <coughs> that is, <coughs> Buddhism has introduced factors of enlightenment. One of them is the factors of factor of enlightenment of investigation. According to that we are not supposed to accept anything on faith, on face value. We always have to question, discuss, think, meditate, read, spend lot of time before we accept anything that Buddha taught. And that leads to the fact, leads to enlightenment. That means free investigation, free inquiry, exercising our supreme freedom of choice is a unique characteristic of Buddhism. In fact, Buddha himself has said, just like when you take a piece of gold, you have to burn it, put it on an anvil and hammer, cut it, test, run all the necessary and sufficient tests that you can think of, and then finally, if the piece of gold stands all these tests, then you accept it as a goal, as a piece of gold. Otherwise, just purely because it shines, because it glitters, it appears to be yellow, don't accept it as a piece of gold. So, this unique feature, I think, outstands the Buddha's teaching about, I think, many, many other religions. Thank you, sir. And uh, one more question. Dharma, sir. Uh, in most of the religions, there is a figure or character where it's known as a supernatural being. And we call this God.
Okay, now, uh, we don't have such a teaching in Buddhism. And hence, Buddhism is known as an aesthetic religion. Is it true? No, sir. Buddhism um, is uh, a theistic, not atheistic. That is, <coughs> it is not built around one idea of a one supreme being. However, it is <coughs> very beautiful, um, there's a beautiful uh, central teaching, which is called Niyama. There are various laws, Uttu Niyama, Chitta Niyama, Dhamma Niyama, Kamma Niyama and Bija Niyama. These are universal truth, universal factors. If somebody wants to have a figure, the head, the supreme center of um, a being, perhaps we can use this as our, uh, our God. You know, idea or the word God is sometimes uh, misinterpreted. And therefore, some people are afraid of using the word God. I, didn't, I think we don't have to be afraid of the word. We have to use and learn to give an interpretation of the word God. We don't have one single personal God, but we have uh, immaterial, impersonal, non-anthropomorphic God that sometimes can be equated with, or with Nibbana or with these natural, normal laws that governs the entire universe. Therefore, in that sense, we call Buddhism is atheistic, not atheistic. <coughs> so further to uh, Dr. Dunarathana's explanation, I'd like to add a few more words. He defined that word atheistic as a theistic. But I would like to introduce this non-theistic. It is not atheistic. Buddhism is not atheistic, non-theistic religion. But the definition is not only for the Creator God. Just because Buddhists do not believe in a Creator God, it is impossible to introduce Buddhism as atheistic because there are many more ideas. Those who do not believe in cause and effect, those who do not believe that there will be another existence hereafter, this is the first and the last life, those who maintain more materialistic Views, they are atheists, but not Buddhists. Thank you. And I would like to crave your indulgence to have your insult, insights into why is meditation so paramount, so important in Buddhism, and uh, how does it affect us? What do we benefit from us? And the whole ramification of meditation. Thank you. I'm very pleased to answer your question. Uh, uh, my, my fear is that uh, a time assigned for uh, this uh, discussion is so limited, therefore I might, not, uh, be, I might not be doing the justice to your question. However, within this limited time, I like to spend few minutes trying to answer your question. <coughs> Meditation is the heart of Buddhism. Heart of Buddhism is because from the uh, from, from the time Siddhartha Gautama, who was just a little an infant, from that time, for 35 years, he spent meditating. After that, he attained enlightenment and did not give up meditation. Sometimes people wonder, you meditate just to attain enlightenment, to cleanse your mind of all psychic irritants, once you cleanse your mind of psychic irritants, you, sh you don't need any more meditation. But that Buddha, who got rid of all his psychic irritants, 
and attain perfect enlightenment, supreme wisdom, and still after that he continued to practice meditation in order to keep himself in touch with bliss of emancipation. Now you can see even his death, Buddha's death, took place in meditation. He attained the, uh, the ninth uh, jhana, <coughs> in material jhana, and then came back to first material jhana, and then attained again the fourth material jhana and passed away. So you can see even the Buddha, who attained perfect enlightenment, had attained that state through the practice of meditation. No matter what else we do, we can practice morality, we can practice uh, 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 what you call dhana, generosity, but without the practice of meditation, none of us will be able to attain enlightenment. Because of this, <coughs> I ask people, who postponed the attainment of enlightenment till Maitre Buddha. My question is, what is wrong with Gautama Buddha? <laughs> is Gautama Buddha lack of his enlightenment? Does Maitre Buddha teach something different from Gautama Buddha? Maitre Buddha will teach the same Dhamma Gautama, that Gautama Buddha taught. And therefore, center to the Buddha's teaching is meditation because it is the only thing that one would be able to remove one's own deeply rooted psychic irritants. Furthermore, I would like to mention in the Heart of Buddhist Meditation Sutra, which is called Four Foundations of Mindfulness, at the very outset of that Sutra, he said, this is the only way. When we say the word only way, sometimes that can turn people off. They might think because even the Buddha himself denied the uh, claim of being only way. And yet, in this particular sutra, he mentioned that same phrase which he denied at the beginning. The reason is, <coughs> only way means when one follows meditation, one would end up only in one place. Nowhere else. There are many other ways to attain various other states. Even one wants to go to heaven, all one has to do three things. Satchangbhane, nakujyaya, dajja pasminti achito, etehi tihithanehi, gacche devanusantike. You speak the truth, give whenever you are asked, don't get angry. By practicing these three things, one can go to heaven. But practicing these three things, one cannot liberate oneself from all psychic irritants. And therefore, when we practice meditation, slowly and gradually we, we like to turn our own senses inwardly. Our senses are always extroverted. They bring all kinds of sensory stimuli from outside, outside world. But when we meditate, we turn our senses inwardly and try to dig out the problems, difficulties, psychic irritants that we already have buried in our subconscious mind, which come to the surface when we try to meditate, and then we have to deal with them. We are dealing with our own aggregates. We have to look at our aggregate form, feeling, perceptions, thoughts and consciousness exactly as they are when we, when we introvertly focus our mind on ourselves these are the aggregates that we see as they are. Seeing these factors, these aggregates exactly as they are, is the only way to cleanse our mind of all psychic irritants. For this reason, Buddha said, meditation is the heart of entire, entire teaching. Moreover, <coughs> Buddha praised the one who meditates, not the one who does anything else. Remember at the moment of death of the Buddha, when he was going to pass away, all unenlightened monks were weeping, whining, wailing, crying over the very idea of the death of the Buddha. But one monk was sitting under a tree, and when somebody having uh, beings uh, very uh, petty minded approached the Buddha and uh, made uh, complaint, that so-and-so is sitting under a tree and meditating. Then Buddha said, that is my son. 
who wants to attain that supreme enlightenment before my passing away. So, from the day he attained enlightenment till he passed away, in every sermon, directly or indirectly, he emphasized meditation. So he knew the meaning, the benefits of meditation. That is why I say, your question is quite relevant, very pertin uh, pertinent to this discussion, and I'm very glad you asked me the question. And I my, my really regret is that I don't have much time to answer in full. Thank you very much. Thank Good you. evening, Venerable Sirs. Um, what I'd like to ask is that, from the Buddhist point of view, is there a difference between mindfulness and concentration? Thank you. Um, from, a, from a Buddhist point of view, it takes mindfulness to gain concentration. The word mindfulness means attention, and you have to have strong attention to gain any concentration at all. The way people are practicing concentration techniques these days is to fix their mind very strongly on one object of meditation. When they fix their mind very strongly on an object of meditation, it doesn't move from that object of meditation after they've developed their mind to a degree. When you fix your mind on an object of meditation, let's say watching the breath, and your mind gets into a state of absorption, a very deep um, and pleasant state of mind. At that time, your mind does not allow certain kinds of mental states to arise. There's five different kinds of hindrances that can arise while you're, you're sitting in meditation or while you're practicing your daily life. You have greed arise in your mind or lust. You have hatred or aversion. You have sleepiness and dullness. You have restlessness and anxiety. And you have doubt. Now the doubt is whether you're doing the practice in the correct way. When your mind gets to a certain state of concentration, these hindrances are pushed down. They're not allowed to come up. Your mind is very deep at that time. When you're practicing in this way, you're not able to see the true nature of how your mind really works because it's pushing down part of that experience. When you're practicing true awareness, when you're practicing attention on what is happening in the present moment, that does not push down any of the hindrances. So you're purifying your mind more by using mindfulness or strong attention without going so deep as the concentration does. So you want to not practice the kind of deep concentration when an anger arises, when your mindfulness is very strong, then you're able to recognize that, open up your mind, relax your mind, allow that to be there without getting involved in it and then redirect your mind back to an object to meditation. So this lets you see the true nature of your mind and body process. I think uh, there's a big difference between concentration and uh, mindfulness. I just want to add to what uh, Venerable said. Concentration definitely suppresses hindrances and uh, allows the mind to attain absorption concentration, which ends up in attaining jhanas. And however, that concentration is absolutely necessary for attainment of uh, insight, to gain 
uh, wisdom. When you gain true concentration, right concentration, right concentration is the concentration where you will be able to see impermanence, unsatisfactoriness and selflessness of your form, feeling, perception, thought and consciousness. To do that you have to have a good concentration. That concentration can be either uh, jhanic concentration or excess concentration. However, when you have concentration, you suppress psychic irritants and you would not destroy them. When you attain mindfulness, practice mindfulness, insight, you not only suppress them, but you will destroy them. This is the difference between do these two aspects of meditation. One suppresses hindrances and other psychic irritants, the other destroy them. <coughs> these are the differences. And both can be approached from two angles and eventually both converge at one point at the attainment of stream entry. That is all the time we have for this first session, but we are going to come back for the second session which will be dealing with the social aspects of Buddhism. So stay with us. And once more, thank you very much to our most venerable panel. Thank you, sir. Welcome back. And this is the second part of our series, Introducing Buddhism. And this time, for the next 50 minutes or so, we are going to examine the social aspects of Buddhism. And once again, we have our panel of distinguished speakers and we have our members from the studio audience. Could I, without wasting any more time, call upon the first question? Yes, Dr. Tan. Uh, good evening, uh, Reverend Sir. May yes. I ask this question that in what way Buddhism contributes to the welfare of uh, humanity? Thank you. I think we will be benefited in three ways through Buddhism. As long as we live here in this world, the Buddha has given all the necessary instructions and guidance and advices to lead a very peaceful, happy, prosperous, contented life. At the same time, Buddhism also teaches us how to live in this world by fulfilling all our duties and responsibilities and obligations towards our family members, our relatives, our friends, and the country, and the nation, and the government by leading a respectable, harmless, noble life. On the other hand, when there are certain problems and troubles, how to face them, how to overcome them, how to avoid through understanding, by realizing the teachings of the Buddha. Not only that, one day, when we are going to depart from this world, Buddhism also advises how to get ready for that. Without fear, without worries, without confusion, how to depart or say how to goodbye, say goodbye, as long as we live. After that, Buddhism also teaches this is not the first and the last life. The continuity or the existence again takes place, whether we believe or not, whether we can understand or not, existence takes place. Therefore, Buddhism teaches how to prepare for the next existence. If we are going to exist in this samsara, wheel of existence, then he has taught, saying like this, Punyani paralokasmin patitha hunti panina. After our death, 
only our meritorious deeds, what we have done during this lifetime, will support and assist and provide all the requisite necessities for us. Therefore, Buddhism teaches how to prepare for the next life, not to suffer, to lead again a happy, peaceful, prosperous, contented life. Human beings are the only living beings who can do that. Other living beings do not know how to prepare for the next existence. In that respect, we are very fortunate. Especially Buddhism teaches us how to do that. Not only that, Buddhism does not encourage us to suffer life after life, going round and round and round in this sansara, wheel of existence, facing birth and old age and sicknesses and troubles and death and problems and trouble. Why not we try to see the end of all our physical and mental suffering? Uh, then Buddhism teaches how to get rid of all our physical and mental suffering by eradicating all our evil thoughts, words and actions. Finally, the, when complete purification has taken place in our mind, final salvation. Final salvation means every religion use the word salvation. That means there is no controversy that everybody, irrespective of their religion, suffer. So salvation means freedom from suffering. Liberation, salvation, freedom from physical and mental suffering. That we use the word nirvana. Complete freedom from our physical and mental suffering. Uh, that is why I told you at the beginning, in three ways we will be benefited. To lead the respectable, normal, happy, peaceful, prosperous life. Hereafter not to suffer again. Buddhism teaches us how to do that. And also to see the end of all our worldly and physical and mental sufferings. Thank you. Anything else? Yes. Guru Ratna? Yes. Guru Ratna with the rest. I think I, uh, I, re I really appreciate uh, Venerable's uh, response. All I can do occasionally is uh, adding footnotes to what he says. <laughs> <laughs> Buddhism, uh, in, in the social dimension, we see Buddhism teaches us to discipline ourselves. We have to discipline intellectually, spiritually, and morally, we have to discipline. We are enjoying a maximum freedom, freedom with responsibility. Freedom with responsibility can not be abused if we learn to discipline ourselves. People who have, ed who have great education, great wealth, great good health, social status, can suffer enormously for not having sufficient discipline. Discipline to use their wealth, discipline to use their health, discipline to use their friends, discipline to use their responsibility and freedom. And this discipline is the wonderful gift of Buddhism. Spirit, uh, moral discipline comes what is called through sila, a spiritual discipline comes from through, st through two stages. One is called concentration, the other is called insight. When we have these three stages of discipline, we sometimes call it sila, samadhi, panya, which is a unique contribution of the Buddha's teaching for our own well-being, peace, happiness, solace and comfort. Thank you, Venerable Sir. Uh, you touched on a very, very important point there where you said the discipline to spend our wealth. Too many Buddhists think that if they are Buddhists, they must not spend their energy seeking wealth. And this has given us a very bad name. 
But by saying that we must have the discipline to, to earn wealth, you are also saying that there is nothing wrong with earning wealth, provided that we know how to use it. Thank you for, for reminding us of this. I think our Buddhists need to be uh, reminded. And maybe, Dato, you want to add a footnote? Uh, with your kind indulgence, again, this being uh, a dialogue, and since this is a very relevant aspect of Buddhism, that we are talking about ourselves for the first time vis-a-vis -vis Buddhism, I thought I would try and make some comments and get some response from the distinguished learned panel. And that is in terms of personal self-development. I mean, we talk in terms of what is the relevance of Buddhism to us here and now in this existence. And listening to your wisdom and insights, I can't help but get the impression that Buddhism has the guidelines to go forward, that we individually have potentials and skills, innate potentials and skills in ourselves, and Buddhism allows, because of the discipline of the mental side and the physical side, meaning the de development of the bhavana method of improving your mental faculties through meditation, and the sila aspect of developing our physical being, that we are able then to have personal self-development in any aspect of our endeavors. That's one aspect. The other aspect is the health aspect, because no other religion can guarantee immediate benefits through better healthy conditioning of the being. Maybe uh, I would be, I think, appropriate if I ask uh, our most venerable Dr. Gunaratna to respond on that. Thank you. No, yes. <coughs> I think that's a very good uh, uh, question. Uh, we, we have to talk about mental health. We have to talk about uh, quality life. Quality life does not come from material things that we have accumulated. Uh, amount of cars, amount of uh, bank account and uh, friends and relatives and food and so forth. The quality life comes from the state of mind. The state of mind has to be healthy, peaceful and happy. You know in the world today, affluent, in affluent societies, there are enormous amount of uh, uh, problems. Patients, mental patients, psychiatric hospitals, psychoanalysts, psychologists, dealing, trying to deal with mental problems. Not because they don't have enough material wealth, but because they have not had their uh, intellectual, spiritual discipline to train their mind, to cleanse the mind, purify the mind, to make their life a qualitative life. And therefore, help comes from qualitative state of mind, quality mind. Quality mind comes from the sound state of mind, which is the outcome of the practice of meditation. And therefore, that's quite a relevant question. I'm very pleased to uh, please to mention these few points. Thank you, Venerable Sir. Can I invite the next question now, please? Charlie. Yeah. Uh, Venerable Sir, I would like to ask regarding certain concepts that we uh, have, which compared with other religions differs. For example, the concept of soul, the concept of origin of life, the concept of universe. And uh, if other religions do not share the same views as what we have, what is our attitude towards these religions? Thank we you. don't have to impose our views, our beliefs, our understanding upon other people. If somebody accepts, believe, follow, well and good. If not, we leave them alone and follow what we believe to be true. It is not absolutely necessary for us to believe in all these things as we already have mentioned earlier. What is necessary is to live this life uh, peacefully and happily. I think there, is, there are uh, four solaces given in uh, one of the famous uh, sutras which is considered to be the sutra uh, that outlines the criterion of judgment. That sutra is called uh, Kalam Sutra. In that sutra, Buddha said, suppose there is no future life. 
and yet if you live very wicked life unwholesome life committing all kind of evils then you will suffer in this life if there is a rebirth or next life then you will suffer twice here and hereafter similarly if you do good if there is no life after death then you experience joy and happiness here and now if there is a next life then you will be rewarded twice here and hereafter with this belief with this understanding we proceed and we don't have to enforce this upon others whether there is the uh, life after death or this belief or that belief uh, we don't have to uh, impose this upon others we just practice may i add a footnote for the venerable doctor gunratana's answer of course we have a lot of religions in the world whatever religions we believe or whatever religions we practice whichever the buddha or god we pray we each and every one of us all the we take human beings we all human beings came to this world in the same way whatever the religious label we have whether in european countries or asian countries or any other country we came to birth, birth has taken place in the same way each and every one of us and we has grown up also the same way every one of all the children they have to go to school and study and pass exams and they have to get a job to find earn their living whichever the buddha or any other god they pray and we all of us we grow old as buddha says who were born to this world we slowly grow up and we are all subject to all kind of sicknesses decay and finally one day either young days or uh, when we grow old we all of us have to pass away depart from this world so this all the process has taken place whichever the religious label or belief we had in the same way so after death also whether we pray to god or brahma or to the buddha if we lead the harmonious peaceful contented life during this lifetime or after death also if there is a rebirth definitely it will be a very good one members i have a question to ask uh, in spite of all the buddhist missionary work that we have been doing some people still regard buddhist as mean not very active in missionary work and some people would like to look at it and interpret it as because the nature of dharma is ehi pasiko that means it invites people to come and see and they interpret it that is because dharma is you come and see if you don't come you don't see so we 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 just wait for you so because of that interpretation people assume that dhamma if if there is a karmic association they will come if there is no maybe it's not the time yet and because of that they still we should not preach people will come if there's a right time they will come to the dhamma what the uh, do reverences have to well, comment no, on sir. this we have come can you show <laughs> yes i'm going to show now <laughs> well I agree with you that Buddhist are not active in missionary work. The reason is Buddhist do not believe that the followers of other religions go to hell. Buddhist do not believe the followers of other religions are sinners. we never think that we must convert them into our religion because the buddha has mentioned whenever wherever you find truth accept the truth whether it is in your religion or any other religion or some other 
But this freedom you cannot find in many other religions. We know how to appreciate the teachings of other religions also. We can agree with them in many areas. No doubt there are differences. We never feel actually that it is necessary to drag them into our religions. Why not to allow them to practice their own religion? Because every religion teaches to do good, to be good, have peace of mind, lead a respectable life, but they have different concept and belief about the life or the beginning of this life or the end of this life. They have different views. They are not very important for us to live peacefully with mutual understanding we can allow others also to practice their religion. We can work with them. We can live together without showing any discrimination or hostility to the followers of other religion. Our duty is to tell the truth, reveal the Dharma. We have been associating with the followers of many other religions in this country. There were many occasions we had the opportunity to explain what the Buddha taught. They appreciated no argument, no disagreement. Truth is truth. So if Christians can remain as good Christians, Muslims can remain as good Muslims, Hindus can remain as good, good Hindus, that is what we need as Buddhists. Not necessary for us to bring them into our religion, give another religious label. On the other hand, there are some who have no religion at all. They do not believe in God, they have no heaven, no hell, no rebirth, no God, no punishment, nothing. But they too, many of them, lead respectable life. They do a lot of services to others on humanitarian ground by extending their kindness and compassion and sympathy and understanding, but not expecting any reward from God, not to avoid the punishment from God. To me, they are real religious people because they are not selfish. All the other followers, they expect something from the Buddha or from the God, otherwise they don't want to practice their religion. But those people who do some service to others, who lead a noble, respectable life through understanding. So as Buddhists, we appreciate their way of life. Therefore, we also never think those who have no religion also go to hell. Thank you very much. Venerable Sirs, I would like to ask a question on status of women in religion. Because as we know, some religions practice discrimination on women in religious practices. What is the Buddhist attitude on this issue? I think, uh, very strictly speaking, sex has nothing to do with the attainment of liberation. If one cleans one's own mind whether the person is man or woman, that person can attain liberation from psychic irritants. In Buddhism, uh, we should say, very strictly speaking, there is no discrimination whatsoever. Discriminations have been imposed upon people of one category or another by the, by the social conditions, social norms, according to traditions. That has nothing to do with the real teachings of the Buddha. Buddha's teaching is the way, a method, a system of cleansing the mind. If one understands that, whether the person is a man or woman, that person can attain liberation. And that is our uh, very uh, unique position in the Buddha's teaching. Uh, you have uh, given a theoretical discussion on the position of women in Buddhism. But if we analyze in detail, nuns are supposed to respect the monks, even though they may be more senior than the, the monks. So how do you argue for this? 
Now, uh, these are because of the social conditions that Buddha imposed. At the time, we had to we had to look at the history of the development of nuns order. At the time when the nuns order was introduced to Buddhism, women's position was lower than animals' position. You all know the historical background of how nuns order was introduced at that time. And therefore, in order to please them, Buddha had added additional conditions only to please them. Otherwise, these are not invariable, unchangeable, permanent, eternal laws. They can be changed from time to time. If the society at that time were as enlightened as today, as uh, liberal as today, as educated as today, people have been uh, going forward, thinking, discussing of equanimity and equality. If that was happening at that time, Buddha would have not introduced these new additional rules. And therefore we have to accept the fact that these have been introduced by the Buddha to meet the demand at that time in that society. It may not be applicable today. Therefore, I think, and Buddha himself has mentioned, that you can change the rules and regulations, which are the, uh, the rules and regulations to govern uh, an organization. Like, a, like when you have an organization, you make constitution. Constitutions, constitutional laws, rules can be changed from time to time. But the truth of Dhamma can never be changed. I am talking about the truth of Dhamma. If a woman, whether she is senior nun or junior nun, ordained or non-ordained, if a woman realizes the truth, to that extent, to that degree, she is eligible to attain attaining enlightenment. That is what I am talking about. I think Dr. Vinayatana has given an excellent interpretation regarding this issue. We never think the nature of the society in India that existed 2,500 years ago. And all the, the conditions that the Buddha has given for women is not to show any discrimination, but for their protection. Because it is very difficult for them to lead a very tough and very hard life in those days. There were no proper monasteries, no shelters. Many of those monks were staying in open areas, under the trees and jungles and here and there. And women cannot do that. That is why the Buddha was reluctant to allow them to enter into the holy order because it is difficult for them to protect themselves. On the other hand, Buddha was the only religious teacher in this world who has opened the gate for women to enter into the holy order. Even today, this 20th century, in the modern world, in the West also, still they are reluctant to give this freedom to women. Buddha has done this 2,500 years ago. Full authority for nuns or the women to lead the religious life. Again, the belief was that, at that time, that women's mentality was very low. Their duties are confined only to the kitchen, to look after their children, to attend to their husbands. In fact, there is a belief that if woman also wants to go to heaven, she had no separate passport, must use the husband's passport. See, that means they were not independent. Some people believe that women had no soul, like animals. The Buddha understood. He said, don't think the man is the only wise man, intelligent man, always. Women also intelligent and wise, the Buddha mentioned. Again, the king who was worrying about uh, giving birth a uh, baby girl, his queen, the Buddha said, why do you worry? Do you know, sometimes, Girls are better than boys who use this word, the Buddha. So, no any other religious teachers who ever uttered such words. 
Therefore, there is no reason whatsoever for people to say that Buddhism supports such weak ideas, discrimination, given full freedom, and the, we had to change, we had to amend our way of life that we call Vinaya. Vinaya is changeable. Vinaya is not Dharma. Dharma is not changeable, what the Buddha taught. But Vinaya, way of life, discipline, custom, tradition, manners, all are changeable. Many people can understand that. I think this is enough. Yeah, thank you. I think we've got to move on. Uh, Jinli, I think you are dying to ask us. Yes, yeah, but I think we should give them a, a voice. Yes. Maybe very short. Can women attain arahanthood, first thing? If so, were there any documented uh, records of women attaining arahanthood? Oh, yes. Thank you. oh yes, women have attained arahanthood in the time of the Buddha. There is a special uh, poem uh, dedicated to women. These are the spontaneous expressions of enlightened nuns. And that particular uh, collection is called Theri Gata. The spontaneous uh, recitals of uh, fully enlightened nuns. And therefore, nuns can attain, women can attain full enlightenment, become full arahant, and attain nibbana without any problem. I think we shall leave the woman and come to another question. Come to another. <laughs> now, many people mention that Buddhism is a very pessimistic religion. From the doctrinal aspects, they argue that uh, Buddhism preach things like uh, suffering, uh, impermanence egolessness, uh, voidness, such teachings are seen to be pessimistic. And from the practical aspects, they say Buddhists are not very energetic in their missionary work, which we have mentioned just now, or Buddhists are spending too much of their time under the tree, doing nothing but closing their eyes and cross-legged. So what is your response to this? Buddhism, is it a very pessimistic religion? Actually, Buddhism is not pessimistic, but realistic. Since the Buddha has revealed the truth, the fact and reality in our life, some people say Buddhism is a pessimistic religion. The Buddha did not use sugar-coated words just to please us. He wanted to show the real picture actually what our life is and what we are doing here and what will happen to us very clearly explained. He never stopped his preaching, his Dhamma, simply by saying, oh, the life is full of birth is suffering, death is suffering, sickness is created suffering, old age creates suffering, this is suffering, that is suffering. He did not stop his preaching. He also preached how to stop all these suffering, how to avoid all these suffering. And the method taught by the Buddha for us to, to, to keep away or to avoid, to stop all these suffering is called dharma. And then we gain confidence, we gain understanding. After that, that negative aspect, disappear from the mind, then we gain confidence. Then we come to understand what this life is, how to make use of this, or what to do with this life, we can understand, without creating imagination about our life. Therefore, definitely it is not a pessimistic religion. Anything else? Uh, when you practice letting go of states of mind that are that pull you down anger jealousy frustration sadness when you practice letting those go when you finally do let those states of mind go you experience very strong joy and happiness and peace of mind and you're talking about uh, being a missionary if you want to be a missionary be a missionary by example 
you practice developing your mind so that you can experience this joy and this happiness and people will come to you and want some of that and they will look you up you don't have to go out looking for them to try to convert them to one thing or another they will come to you and say you look happy and I want some of that so sitting under a tree is a very useful thing learning how to develop your mind so that you can experience joy and happiness is what the Buddha was talking about when he said we are the happy ones we're happy when we help other people we're happy when we keep our precepts we're happy when we let go of unwholesome mental states that's the best way to be a missionary by example and Russell, would you like to add to that yes you know those who are familiar with Buddhist texts would not say that Buddhism is pessimism in Buddhist texts we always find there's a one whole section a chapter in the Dhammapada that's called Sukhavagga the chapter of happiness in that chapter he, Buddha says let us live happily among those who are miserable let us live happily among those who are sick let us live happily among those who are full of tension worries anxieties fears let us live happily with those who are suffering from pain suffering let us live happily without greed without hatred without confusion who else can become happy and Buddha's teaching has only one taste taste of peace taste of joy taste of happiness whereas when you go to a Buddhist temple what do you see in the shrine room a smiling Buddha laughing Buddha laughing Buddha also we can see you know uh, Nehru Indian first Prime Minister whenever he was disappointed depressed full of tensions worries he went to his office where there was a beautiful smiling Buddha he sat in front of that image and focus his mind on this beautiful smiling face of the Buddha and he got inspiration from that Buddha you get inspiration when you see the Buddha statue you get inspiration when you see Buddhist monks they are smiling laughing uh, they always uh, are very relaxed and therefore I don't see in my own life in my own association with the Dhamma and the Buddha Buddhist teachings I never see any pessimism in it this is no selfishness for us to live happily while others are happening and <laughs> <laughs> I have a question to ask some people say renunciation is running away from worldly duties and responsibilities what is your explanation then sir? renunciation uh, actually is not running away from reality but facing reality when you learn to face reality you learn to renounce unreality you accept reality and let go of unreality today's the problem is today's world is that they have turned everything topsy-turvy they see um, unreality as reality and reality as unreality and that is what is called distorted perception when the it is just like magic show when you go to see a magic show you will sit in front of a magician and you will be fooled you will be laughed you will be booed you will be clapped clapping your hands but one of you goes behind the screen and make a little hole and peep through the hole at the magician then every time magician takes a stick you know what is what he is going to do when he takes his cap he you know what he is going to do at the end you really realize what the magician was doing what he has done when you come out of your hiding and face audience one of your friends would come up to you and ask you have you seen magics you would say there's no magic then your friends will laugh at you thinking my poor friend is gone out of his mind he does not see magic 
and he, sa he says there is no magic, then you, you will tell the audience, your friends, my friends are fools. They have distorted perception, distorted views, and therefore they think there is magic. Now who is uh, real here and who is distorted? And therefore, these days, people who see the truth are considered to be abnormal. <laughs> Those who see the unreal, untruth, got distorted, confused, deceived, are considered to be normal. So we have to make the distinction between the normality and abnormality. We have to make the distinction without right seeing and wrong seeing. And that is what we are trying to do. I think this word renunciation is a very critical issue in Buddhism. Because there are some religionists who cannot tolerate this renunciation. That is why they say people are running away from worldly duties and responsibilities and obligations. But when you study the instructions, guidance given by the Buddha to those who have renounced the worldly life, he said, go forth, don't stay here in the monastery or somewhere else, go and do some service to others for the well-being, for the benefit, for the happiness of others. Tell them what is right and what is wrong. Again, after this renunciation, there are a lot of duties for us to fulfill. In fact, we cannot even forget our father and mother. The Buddha says, you can go and bathe them, feed them, if they can't afford to find out their food or they are living. And real meaning of renunciation is not to become slaves to worldly pleasure, sensual pleasure, which is a fleeting nature, which can blindfold us, which can mislead us. Keep away from all these sensual pleasure, fulfill your duties, responsibilities toward the public for their well-being. We will now take another break and we'll meet again for the third part of our series, Introducing Buddhism. Stay with us and thank you once again to our most venerable panel. Thank you. Thank you for staying with us and welcome to the third part of our series, Introducing Buddhism. Now we will try and examine some of the more deeper doctrinal aspects that uh, Buddhists like to ask. Well, was, uh, during the time of the Buddha, there were in existence a number of religions. Why is it that the Buddha wants to introduce another religion? Thank you very much. Yes. When you study the historical background, of all the existing religions in India, the Buddha, as a young prince, studied all the existing religions and philosophy and associated with great religious teachers and practiced their beliefs and traditions and religious customs by following their advice. Later, he came to know. By following all these beliefs and practices and traditions, he won't be able to gain enlightenment. That is not the method to gain enlightenment. He knew that many people depend only on God for everything, worshipping, praying, and sacrificing animals and so many other things in the name of God to please, to get the blessing. The Buddha 
new. That is not the correct method to gain either enlightenment or salvation. Then he also noticed there were many others who torture their physical body in the name of religion as religious practices, thinking then they can wash away all the sins or the bad karmas that they have committed earlier by burning, cutting, poking, starving, without eating, without taking medicines when they were sick, and behaving like animals, not as human beings, by following animals' way of life. So he said, these practices are not the real religious practices. By torturing this body, we cannot wash away the bad karmas or the sins committed by us. Then he also realized there is no freedom for human beings to think freely, to understand the truth. To understand the truth, they must depend on some body or some external sources. So, he said like this, Paturaho si magade si kubbe. The dharma that I am going to preach is not a new dharma, new doctrine or new religion. This dharma, this religion existed long ago, but completely polluted, misled, blindfolded, misinterpreted by the people. The real dharma, real truth completely disappeared. Therefore, in the name of religion, many people are practicing all sort of things where I cannot find any religious value. Uh, that is why he wanted to introduce the dharma, not a religion, noble way of life for human beings to lead a respectable life by maintaining human dignity and cultivating their way of life, developing their understanding, purifying their mind. All the existing religions depend on faith and belief. The Buddha realized faith and belief are changeable from time to time according to understanding, experience and maturity. Therefore, important thing is not the faith or the belief, but purity of the mind. When the purity appeared in the mind, there is nothing to believe. No faith, no belief, purity, then the enlightenment, confidence, we gain later enlightenment. To contribute uh, this aspect of religion, he had to introduce this dharma, today we introduce as Buddhism. Reverend Tuss, my question is, are rituals important in Buddhism? Rituals, for the sake of rituals, are not important in Buddhism at all. Rituals have their own place. They are peripheral to the main teachings of the Buddha. The Buddha's teaching now has become like a huge tree. When you look at a tree from the top, you will see the canopy, leaves, branches, flowers, fruits, and then come down you will see the uh, soft wood, and then roots. Inside all this there is heart, the core of the tree. Similarly, uh, in the Buddha's teaching there, are, there is the core, heart, but it cannot preserve, it cannot be put into practice by itself by everybody. There are certain people who certainly need certain amount of rituals in order to approach Buddhism, in order to understand Buddhism. But they must understand that these rituals do not bring them salvation, liberation from their psychic irritants. They have 
a place for them to get involved, get interested in the practice of the true Dhamma. And therefore, I must say, the rituals themselves don't have uh, the, uh, the major role to play in order to understand the Dhamma. When one realizes the Dhamma and attains liberation from psychic irritants, when they come to that point, then they have to let go of all rituals. To believe pre uh, that one can attain liberation from psychic irritants by following rituals itself is a fetter. So one has to let go of that fetter in order to gain true liberation from psychic irritants. I think rites and rituals are very important at the beginning. Just like children need toys to play, but when they grow, automatically they throw away. Exactly in the same manner, most of these rites and rituals that we perform for a certain period until realization appear in the mind. Another thing, we have to define this word, ritual. Some are based on our traditions. Some are based on our culture, our way of life. Some are meaningful. Just because they are rituals, we cannot throw away everything at once. Some are meaningful. But the advice given by the Buddha is this. Even to attain the first stage of sainthood, sotapanna, no one can gain that unless, until, completely eradicate that belief that they maintain. Through these rites and rituals and practices, they can gain their salvation. Pilabhata paramasa, not to cling, not to develop attachment to a the rites and rituals, when, we, when they develop our mind up to that extent. The mentality of our society, say for example a Buddhist country, their way of thinking, uh, the knowledge is not all are very advanced. So the basic teaching like Four Noble Truth, Eight Noble Path, Anicca Dukkha Anatta, all these things are each and each one of each and every one of them cannot understand. Maybe number can be very few. So those who cannot understand at the beginning stage, to them all those uh, rites, rituals and ceremonies are important. For the Buddhists, after we die, we will be reborn. And for the, the other religionists, they will go to hell or go to heaven. But what happened to those who do not belong to any religion? Things never take place according to our belief. We can believe anything, but natural occurrences take place according to universal law or natural phenomena. Some people say they do not believe in rebirth. If rebirth is natural, can they stop their rebirth just because they don't believe it? Impossible. On the other hand, some people say, yes, we believe in rebirth. If there is no rebirth by nature, can they create rebirth just because they believe there will be a rebirth? That's why I told you, belief is not the important thing. Birth is natural. Sicknesses are natural, old age is natural, death is natural, not necessary to believe. Uh, if anything happens after our death, that is also natural. It does not happen according to our belief or according to religious practices or what you call uh, concepts. How can we prove that it is true? In fact, today, many people do not depend on religion or Buddhism 
there are three, four religions like Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism, Sikhism who maintain this belief. Without depending on any religion, many people realized that it is true. When they hypnotize some people, they can recall their previous birth, explain everything, investigate it, hundred percent correct. Again, children in many countries suddenly remember their previous birth, start to tell everything about their previous birth. They have investigated all the information given by these children, correct. All of us have this memory, submerge, so we cannot bring up to our normal mind. According to modern psychology, we can say it is the subconscious mind. But one day, when we develop our mind up to the higher level of sainthood or arahanthood or buddhahood, ah, then we can recall, we can remember all our previous births. Again, let us use our common sense. Why there are so many discriminations amongst the human being? Who is responsible for that? Some people are dying, millions of them are dying without food and starving. Millions of them are living without shelter, without clothing, without medicine and natural disaster, volcanic eruptions, and earthquake, and war. Why do they suffer? We have to analyze, while we are enjoying our life. If there is anybody to create us, one group to enjoy their life, another group to suffer, so what is the reason? From the Buddhist point of view, we can say, those who have done certain bad karmas, those who have not done good karmas, suffer. Quite reasonable. And those who have done enough good karma, those who have led a respect, respectable, noble life, can lead a peaceful, happy, contented life. Ah, that means life exists again and again, Differences take place according to our way of life and nobody else is responsible for that. I think this is enough for us to understand that it is true. Uh, but before I get to that stage of rebirth, what I would like to understand is uh, how does one prepare for death or to face death? Uh, to face death, uh, we have to uh, learn a way to face it with uh, uh, realization, with understanding. That means we have to uh, get rid of the fear of death. People, long before they die, they are dead out of fear of death. And therefore they have to learn to face the truth, the reality. They must learn from the moment that we can, we come to realization, we come to reason and understanding from that time on, we must uh, understand that we all are born with one-way ticket. And there is no one single moment that we can uh, go back and change our directions. We continue to for, go forward with that, um, with that uh, one-way ticket. And therefore, understanding the truth, the reality, the nature of life itself is one way of uh, facing death without fear. Second, is that we must uh, keep our uh, mind as free uh, as possible from numerous psychic irritants such as uh, feeling of indebtedness. There is a particular happiness called uh, anavajja sukha. Anavajja sukha means happiness arising from seeing one's 
flawless life. Flow, anavajja means flawless life, that is living as uh, clean life as possible. Of course it is not possible for somebody to live perfectly clean life, but if one learns to uh, make life as clean as possible, then that person can face death bravely and uh, clear, uh, without fear. Buddha said one very beautiful thing he said. He said, uh, mindfulness is the path to deathlessness. Unmindfulness is the path to death. The mindful never dies, the unmindful is dead already. So when we live unmindfully, we are always trembling, we are always frightened of death. When we live mindfully, moment by moment, seeing this death is happening every second, every moment. You know, every single thing in our body, three trillions of cells in this body, is undergoing changes from the moment we were born till now and into the future, every second. Everything in this body and mind is changing all the time. And therefore, when we see this reality of change, this reality of uh, momentary death of cells, we will realize that these cells will come to a stage where it cannot divide any further. These cells can divide only up to 50 at the, at the time when we are young. As we grow older, the cells number of times these cells can divide will reduce. When they stop producing new cells, these cells will die a conventional death. And therefore when we realize the truth, we can face death very peacefully and happily. What uh, intrigues me is that why can I not remember my previous life? <laughs> you know, I ask you a counter question if you don't get offended. Please try to think of an answer to this question. Suppose I ask you, what did you eat in 1961 uh, uh, on uh, Thursday at, um, uh, for breakfast, what did you eat? What did you eat for lunch in 1960 on Thursday uh, at lunchtime? You don't remember. So let alone previous life, even most of the things that we have done in this very life, we don't remember because our mind is cluttered, confused, full of all kind of information, all kind of conditioning, all kind of facts, all kind of figures, all kind of things are filled, our mind is filled with all sort of things. And therefore it is not virtually possible for someone to recall a previous life. Secondly, if, if somebody dies with confused state of mind, it is most unlikely that that person could remember anything of the past. Thirdly, the time, the gap between death and real conventional birth, free birth, is very long, at least nine, ten months. That is a long period of time for us to forget the past. And therefore, there are many reasons for us not to be able to remember the past. My idea is, it is better not to remember our previous birth. <laughs> we dig out more and more rubbish. <laughs> to stop all these things, forget about the last birth. Well, Venerable Sir, now there are religions which believe that uh, a human being is actually comprises of a body, and an eternal soul. An eternal soul which means that that soul which doesn't change in entity, which doesn't change in characteristics. Does Buddhism agree with this eternal soul? Thank you. I think the uh, answer is very uh, obvious. Uh, Buddhist and Buddhism uh, does not believe in eternal, permanent, unchanging uh, self or soul. When we say we don't believe in eternal, unchanging, permanent soul, people might ask, turn around and ask, uh, do we believe in changing soul? No. It is a concept. You know, recently 
an American uh, uh, biophysicist uh, has written a book. I don't remember its titles, unfortunately. Just you asked the question, it occurred to me that there is a book. And this man has proven that the soul or self is a concept that is constantly created in our mind all the time. And somebody who has written a review on that book has said that this discovery is as revolutionary as the discovery of DNA. That means now more and more uh, intellectual, scientifically oriented, minded people have uh, found out this is a very powerful notion that has been inculcated in our mind from time immemorial and now it is, uh, for some people, it is almost impossible to let go of that notion. But others who are uh, liberal-minded, who are inquisitive, who do not cling to one particular notion or another, have begun to realize that this is the notion that we have very dearly cherished in our mind for long periods of time. And Buddha, almost 3,000 years ago, saw this reality. And therefore he straight, uh, without any hesitation, straightforwardly he mentioned that there is none, whether permanent self or impermanent self. I think this concept of soul is the misinterpretations of consciousness. Because there is no another religion in this world where we can find the analytical interpretation of the mind only in the teachings of the Buddha. So when he analyzed the mind, he pointed out we have four mental faculties. Among those four mental faculties, Vijnana, consciousness, is the most strongest mental faculty, also introduced as departed consciousness. When we die, that consciousness depart from here. For that they use the word soul, because they have not learned how to analyze the consciousness. Because in that consciousness there are so many ingredients, mental energy, avidya, trishna, karma, upadana, bhava, five mental energies are there in that consciousness. I have no time to explain all these things. Again, the five senses bring objects from outside and enrich that consciousness. Again, our feeling, sensation or perception or identification and wholesome and unwholesome mental habits or karma, these things also contribute toward the consciousness. You, you can see how rich it is. There is even modern psychologists also do not know how to interpret, analyze the human mind. Because of this misunderstanding, they use the word soul, but Buddhism introduced as consciousness. Well, sir, I have one question here. Uh, I think in all religions, there is this concept of heaven and hell. And inevitably, we, we talk about uh, one heaven, one hell, permanent heaven, permanent hell. But is it the same in, in Buddhism? So according to Buddhism, there is no particular place that we can introduce as heaven or hell. Either created by a god or come into existence automatically or naturally. One of the rich men during the Buddha's time approached him. His name was Kutadanta. He said, we are rich people, we have no time to meditate and observe precepts and all sorts of things, but even then we would like to go to heaven after our death. Is there any shortcut? Then the Buddha asked, why do we want to wait until you die to experience heavenly bliss? While you are living here in this world, you can experience heavenly bliss. Uh, this is the Buddha's concept regarding heaven. That means 
Heaven is not a particular place located somewhere in this universe. We are living beings experience either in human forms or any other forms. Where they experience peace, happiness, satisfaction in their life, that is heaven. Again, in another discourse, the Buddha says, he used this word, <coughs> only foolish people believe that hell is located under, under this earth or under great ocean or under the Mahameru. Hell is not located anywhere. Hell means endless suffering. From birth up to the last breath, nothing but suffering. Either humans or animals or any other forms of living beings. That is hell. Now we are not in hell. Although we have suffering, we can laugh, we can joke, we can enjoy. Again we suffer, therefore we are not in hell. But there are many other living beings from their birth up to last with nothing but physically and mentally suffer, that is hell. Uh, this is the Buddhist concept of heaven and hell. In uh, uh, Sangyutta Nikaya, there is a statement that Buddha made. He said that he has seen people living in heaven. People living in heaven. How to live in heaven? In heaven you expect deities to live. But he said, I have seen people living in heaven. How? Those two, whenever they see something, hear something, smell something, taste something, touch something and think something, they rejoice it. They don't become envious. They don't become jealous. They don't become angry. They don't, they are not frightened. They enjoy it. These are the ones who experience heaven as human beings. On the other hand, he said, I have seen human beings in hell who are there. They are the ones who whenever they see something, hear something, touch something, smell something, and think something, they are so full of jealousy, fear, anxiety, worry, greed, hatred, and so forth, and therefore they are they are experiencing hell. So I just want to um, support uh, what Venerable already mentioned. We are always made aware that uh, um, uh, don't, be, don't go to extremes. Practice the middle path. Why is Buddhism called the middle path? Thank you. you. Give the answer. <laughs> 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 it's a little further. <laughs> the Buddha's first sermon called Dhamma Chakka Pavattana Sutta, he very clearly mentioned what is middle path. He asked his followers to avoid two extremes, Atta Kilamatana Yoga and Kama Sukhalikana Yoga, self-mortification and self-indulgence. The Buddha mentioned through too much of giving sensual pleasures to your sins, uh, you cannot gain anything. At the same way, torturing your body, you know at that time, you know there are various ways they torture the body, physical body, to find salvation. The torturing also, he said, no way you can find your final goal. So that's what Buddha avoid, asks us to avoid this too much of uh, pleasing our senses and torturing our body, physical body. You cannot find, uh, it's nothing to do with, uh, you cannot find salvation, only you have to develop your mind. For that, you have to practice middle path. Today, in the modern society, a lot of people, they try to misinterpret this middle path. Those who practice, uh, those who used to take alcohol, cigarette and all, 
kind of things. They say we are not going to extreme, we are only practicing middle path. We take 50-50 is all right. That's what the Buddha says. Moderate. That is what the Buddha says, which is wrong actually. This is not what Buddha means. Buddha means don't go to two extremes and to find our own liberation or salvation. Now, brothers and sisters who have been watching this program, Maybe you have other questions. If you do, please do not hesitate to contact us. The address is given at the end of this, uh, will be given at the end of this program. And you can telephone us and we will always be happy to accommodate any questions that you have. And with that, may I say a very big sadhu to our four panelists and a big sadhu to all the members of the studio audience. May you all be well and happy. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you very much.